The Leica Q2 is a genuine made in Germany full frame Leica with a 28 millimeter f1.7 lens. It's built like a tank. It's almost entirely metal. It's built the way a camera should be. Let's first take a look at some of the pictures I can make with this. It's got 47 megapixels. So yes, it is super sharp, but Leicas have been super sharp for over 100 years. That's not news. Colorful? Colors are a matter of taste. I'm not a huge fan of the Leica. Actually, I get better colors from my iPhone 11, but it certainly can make great pictures. Uh, Leicas are not so much about a great picture. They're mostly about having a great lifestyle. An agave plant. All the pictures you'll see in this review are still photos, and I pan and scan and zoom in in my video editing software. The keys are all one shot, one frame, everything shot in JPEG, nothing shot in RAW or DNG, and it's all the way it came out of the camera. It has an innovative digital synthesis of several other lenses. This is synthesized with the 35mm f1.7 Sumalux ASPH. Here's a look at a palm grove. The sky. <laughs> this is insanely sharp, this camera. It also has no distortion. This shot again is, is the way, well, I, I lightened it up a little bit after I shot it, but no distortion correction applied by me. This is all exactly what comes out of the camera as a JPEG. And again, I'm scanning down. Oh, my gosh. The camera is so easy to use. For a shot like this, I simply wanted to show the motion of the water droplets as they look naturally to our eye. So I just took my finger, turned the shutter dial until it moved to a 30th of a second. And the beauty of this camera is, is everything updates in the finder instantly. It's not like cameras designed in Japan, like my Sonys and Fujis, that every time I turn an aperture or shutter speed ring, it takes like half a second for the update in the finder to occur, which drives me crazy. It's like, why do they even bother? With this Leica, when I change a setting, it updates in the finder instantly, so I can change it as I want. So this is shot at a 30th of a second, which is what looks most natural to our eye. And you'll see with the incredible resolution of this camera, I got every single water droplet. And these aren't even water droplets. These are just mist from a sprinkler system. And to adjust the shutter speed, it's easy. Just move the dial. Usually leave it on A, and A gives you program, but if you want to force it into a 30th, just do like that. Boom, you've got a 30th. This camera is ultra easy to operate. That's one of its greatest virtues. It's not like the cameras from Sony or Fuji, which are a pain to operate. And I, I've been shooting for over 50 years, so I remember when cameras were actually designed for photographers, not simply online experts. The key is, this Leica, everything just goes and shoots the way it should. Nothing gets in your way. The menus are very simple. All the operation is simple. Autofocus is autofocus. If you want to go into manual focus, you just unlock the catch on the ring. You're in manual focus. If you want to go into macro mode, you see this? Watch the focus scale. Boom. You're in macro mode. You can just leave it in autofocus, as I always do. The Q2 is extremely popular because it's very inexpensive. It's a genuine German-made full-frame Leica, and it sells for only $5,000. A lot of people don't realize to get into a proper Leica, which is the M series, with a very basic, just 50 millimeter of 1.4 lens and an M10, the most basic M10, you're into it not for $5,000, you're into it for over five figures. Yes. So to get a full frame Leica like this with an excellent lens, this camera also adds full program automatic exposure. It adds through the lens live view in the electronic finder. It adds autofocus. This camera is 60 years ahead of the M series, gives the same quality picture, and includes the lens for an ultra low price. And that's why this camera is an extremely popular camera. The Q2 is worlds ahead of Sony and Fuji because the menu system is quite simple. The menu system is only five pages. You've got a favorites, five pages. Now, in each of these pages, of course, you have more pages, but it all makes sense. It, whatever I want to find or do, it's here. It's unlike Sony's, even when I talk to the Sony factory reps, it still takes them going through every one of their 500 menus to find something which sometimes isn't even there. The Leica Q2 has what we need and nothing more. And that way you can get your picture instead of looking like a moron standing down looking at your camera while everybody else is getting the shot. The key is with this, you are the one getting the shot. Everybody else is the one staring at their finder here, all lost and confused. That's a major advantage of the Q2 is you'll get your shot and not be left fiddling with your menus. Also, far superior to Sony, 
Fuji can equal this is the fact that we have dedicated control rings. And these are much better than the Fuji rings because they are indeed a single purpose. They lock properly. And you can just do this to select your speeds, which seems simple and seems obvious, but it's not obvious to most of the other makers. Most of the other makers have these unmarked dials, like this one's unmarked. What's nifty about this little dial is, you see this? That's an additional push button for control, which I like. Another incredible thing about this camera is it has a leaf shutter. What that means is the shutter is actually inside the lens. It's not a focal plane, which is <laughs> things moving across the sensor slowly. The point is it opens the lens all at one point, so I can synchronize my flash at a two thousandth of a second. The reason synchronizing flash at a two thousandth of a second is critical is I can then use flash in broad daylight, and even a moderately powered flash can compete with direct sunlight. Here's a shot of palm trees shot with the Q2, no flash. And if I pop on my little SF24D flash, which sells used for about $150, bam, here we go. Can light up all these palm trees because I can shoot at a 2,000th of a second on my Q2. The key is at a 2,000th of a second, all the power of the flash is captured by the camera. But because the ambient light is cut down significantly at a 2,000th of a second, the flash becomes much more powerful than the ambient light. And so therefore, if you're really limited by flash power trying to compete against sunlight, you can do that because at a 2,000th of a second, for that one 2,000th of a second, the flash is on all the time the shutter's open, so it can compete. Most cameras are stuck down at, say, 180th or 200th of a second for flash sync, so you're letting in 10 times more ambient light, but the flash itself is no more powerful. So essentially, this Leica Q2 makes your flash 10 times more powerful. What's new since the equally extremely popular Leica Q? Well, it's 46 or 47 megapixels up from 24. This one does 4K video up from 1080. I don't know that I would waste my time shooting video on this camera, but uh, that's for you to know and me to find out. It's got a 3.69 megadot OLED finder, and the finder is awesome because the finder not only has, look at the exit pupil on this, the optics of the finder, the finder optics themselves are superior. Look at the size of that thing. They're all glass and they work extremely well. The electronic viewfinder is much sharper because it has superior optics here where it counts. It uses probably exactly the same OLED screen bought from the same place that the other manufacturers buy it. The key is all of my Nikons and Canons and Sonys, they rarely give a sharp image from edge to edge. They're usually soft areas inside of the finder because the optics aren't up to snuff compared to how great is the panel. The Q2 has a 40,000th of a second electronic top shutter speed. The old Q only had a 16,000th. The longest shutter speed on this is now up to two minutes, which you can select directly in any of the modes where you can select the shutter speed. The old Q2 is limited to 30 seconds. Another beautiful thing about this camera, there's no more battery door. Battery doors are for losers. To drop out this battery, push the unlatch, then it has a safety catch. Just push it in, and it pops right out. The key is you can do this by feel in the dark. You can be running in smoke to your next shot. Pick this battery out of your pocket, feel for the slot, push it home, and you've just reloaded your battery. That is awesome. You don't have to fill around this stupid car door like every other camera has today. Also, if you want a door, you do have a door for the card. This is a very nicely made door. It is solid alloy. This battery is much bigger than the Q battery. The old Q battery was a wimpy little thing. This thing is a good, a good sized battery that you see takes up like a third of the camera's volume. So you get lots of life. As Leica goes, you get about 370 rated shots, which for Leica, you know, that's maybe a week shooting because every shot you make on a Leica is a world-class, prize-winning, immortal photograph. It's not like the other brands of cameras where you throw away most of your shots. The like, you're going to publish most of your shots. New is an ECI RGB version 2.0 color space, as well as the usual sRGB and Adobe RGB. The old Q had cropped modes. You'll notice as I push the lens change button here, I'm changing lenses. It went to 50 millimeters. This now goes to 75 millimeters. So it doesn't actually change the lens. It's just cropping the sensor. But the sensor with 47 megapixels is so many extra pixels. Now, when you shoot, you just get the frame lines, much like a Leica M, and the actual playback does fill up the frame. New from the Q is its IP52 weather sealed. But missing from the Q2 is the power switch is just a power switch. There's no single or continuous mode or self-timer mode on this switch. You have to go to those in the menu system. There's no more red button near the shutter release compared to the old Q. There's no more rear ISO button, and most importantly, there's no more a delete button. Leica realized that nobody who owns a Leica Q or Leica Q2 ever had to delete a photograph. I mean, nobody ever deleted one. Every photograph is perfect with this camera. 
So no one ever used the delete button, so they removed it. If for some reason you're a really bad photographer, I wouldn't know how you got this like it in your hands, but if you did, when you play back, you can push the FN button, and you'll come up with some options where you can delete the file, but I, I don't know if anybody's ever had to do that on Leica. Missing from the old quiz, at least not yet, you can't get silver or titanium finish. The only finish option is what they call black paint. This is paint, and this is black anodize. Good about this camera? Superior to everything? It's made in Germany. It's not offshore to some other country where the camera company isn't even based. It's quality made, and that's what we pay for. This camera has optical image stabilization. There's actually a shifting element in the lens, so you can shoot at slow speeds, not need your tripod. There's a huge range of Kelvin white balance adjustments that go from 2,000 to 11,500. So ultimately, I like showing warm renditions under warm lighting, but if you want to get natural-looking light, even under candlelight at 2,000 degrees Kelvin, the settings are there. Relatively new for Leica is when you change the battery or the card, the camera stays in one piece. Most other Leicas, you have to turn a catch, take the camera apart in two pieces, and hope you don't lose the other piece because then you can't take pictures. Everything stays together on this camera the way it should be, but as Leica hasn't really done for the past 100 years. The dedicated macro mode really works, although you are limited to a maximum aperture of f2.8. Even though you can set these electronically, the camera doesn't open the diaphragm more than f2.8 when you're in that macro mode, and that's to compensate for any lens aberrations, which would be exaggerated when you're at those extra close modes. This is a tough screen. This is Corning Gorilla Glass. It's not plastic. What's bad about the Leica Q2 is, well, it's horrible at high ISOs. Now, I don't know you need a high ISO because you've got an f1.7 lens, and again, as a Leica owner, you are the master of the lights. You're not going to be shooting the pitch black, but at ISO 25,000, ISO 50,000, it looks even worse than most of the APS-C cameras from Japan do. There's very little highlight dynamic range. It's very easy to blow out highlights in this camera. The play button is on the wrong place. You should be able to shoot with one hand, but you can't play back. You have to use your other hand, and then this thumb is now stuck in your eye. That's a defect. Missing. There are no color histograms, black and white histograms only, which means that they're useless if you're shooting in color. And what's worse is this camera has a real problem with highlights getting blown out. You need your histograms. You need them in color. So if you blow out the red channel, for instance, you can see that. It doesn't do that. There's no built-in flash. There's no half-stop clicks. It's only clicks and full stops. So if you want to set something else, you can shift it. But the key is the other like as well, the M like as I have, have half-stop clicks. What's missing is oddly, although the electronic shutter goes to a 40,000th of a second, it only goes in thirds of a stop up to 120,000th of a second. Oddly, the 125,000th and 132,000th speeds are missing. So it only goes in a full stop jump between a 20,000th and a 40,000th. I don't think anybody cares. There's no 49 millimeter cap included. Because most people are going to shoot it with this little vanity hood that doesn't really do anything. And I'll get into that later. But if you want a 49 millimeter cap, you're going to have to go buy that on your own. But I don't use a cap. I use a filter. But I'll cover that at the end. It doesn't have automatic brightness control for the finder. It works okay, but outdoors the finder tends to be a little dim. It does beautifully have automatic brightness control for the LCD. There's no manual focus infinity stop. In other words, if you just want to set this to infinity for landscapes or astronomical stuff, it doesn't stop there. That's a defect. There are no crop modes other than just for magnification. You can't crop the 4x3 or 4x5 or for square. That, I think, is bad. The buttons are not illuminated. That's a petty peeve of mine. None of the cameras really do that except for some of the top-end Nikons and Canons. But considering that every phone I've had since the 1980s have had illuminated buttons so I can talk on my phone in the dark, come on. This stuff needs to be illuminated. There's no cable release socket. You have to use the app for that. There's no remote control terminal. Use the app for that. Missing is you'll notice... This is a real camera. It's not some kid's computer tour to talk about on YouTube. This is a camera for real photographers, so it doesn't have any USB connectors or HDMI connectors or DC connectors. The only connectors it has is a hole for the battery and a slot for your card. That's it. It's a real camera, not a computer toy. No USB port, of course, means no in-camera charging. You have to charge with the external charger. The black and white modes can't simulate the use of a color filter. Overall, the reason this camera is so wonderful is it just shoots really fast. And it's hard to show you on a video because it's not something you see, it's something you feel. When you shoot this camera, it just goes. It doesn't get in your way, it just takes the picture. Autofocus is clairvoyant. It works really well. It just sees, it just automatically selects the correct area, and bam, it focuses really fast. And that is a wonderful thing about this camera. It doesn't get in your way. Talk to any career photographer and he'll tell you. The most important thing about any camera is that it just gets out of the way and lets you get your picture. Most cameras today get in your way. There's too many adjustments. There's too many things that just stop or blink at you. 
No, this light could just shoots. And that way, you've got your picture while the other poor saps are still looking at their menus. The leaf shutter is essentially silent. You don't need the electronic shutter, but if you do use the electronic shutter, then it goes completely silent. The power management is great. I leave mine on all the time. It simply goes to sleep when I'm not touching it. And the next time I pick it up and just tap the shutter button, it wakes right up. So I don't have to worry about the battery running down and always turning off the power. For focus breathing, if you're going to shoot movies on this, which seems a bit silly, the image does get a little bit smaller as you focus more closely. Bokeh is pretty good. Here's a look at it at f1.7. And you'll notice it's real smooth. It never gets that far out of focus because it's such a wide lens. But what is out of focus is really soft. And here it is at f4. You'll notice the character of the bokeh doesn't change. It's really got good bokeh. Auto ISO programs very well. You program it in the menus, and it does exactly what it's supposed to do. Auto white balance works well. I have no complaints with that. Color and tonal rendition. Uh, I don't like the way the pictures look on this camera. I say there's a very little highlight dynamic range, and the color rendition is really pretty yucky. Uh, I'll show that under compared. I'll show you that a, an iPhone takes better pictures than this camera does. Uh, you'll notice an iPhone has about the same focal length and about the same lens speed as this camera. And the iPhone has better color rendition and highlights and shadows. So pictures from the iPhone are better, but it's a Leica. It's not about pictures. It's all about the image of the man making the picture. So you've got this around your neck. You look a lot cooler than just my kid with an iPhone. The crop modes work well. It's really convenient. You just tap this button, you get whatever lens you want from 28 to 75 millimeters. Here's a shot, shot at 75 millimeters. Looks super sharp, and it is. Here's another shot, shot at the 75 millimeter mode. Looks fine. All it really is doing is just cropping into your 47 megapixel image. But because you have so many megapixels in the first place, <laughs> you've got so many pixels, you still got more than you need for anything. Distortion. There is no visible distortion. And even if you shoot a RAW file and open it in software that's not dedicated to this camera, it doesn't have any correction, it still doesn't have any distortion. You get a little bit more wiggle. Uh, again, if this is if you're doing scientific work. If you're doing some scientific work, there's some higher order distortion that's better corrected when you shoot in JPEG. But even if you're shooting RAW, totally uncorrected, the lens is still excellent. Ergonomically, everything gets out of the way. Power on asleep modes are as fast as every other camera today. Ideally, too, just the feel of it, the font Leica uses, it uses this marvelous font that all of these are engraved. It has a countdown timer for longer exposures, so you'll see exactly how long it is to the end of your exposure. What's bad? Nothing's really bad, but these buttons are made very flush to look minimalist. They're not as easy to find by feel, and if you've got gloves on, forget about it. The play and the menu buttons are on the wrong side, so it takes two hands to shoot. The touchscreen works great. But when the virtual keyboard comes up for typing in your copyright information, it's still a little bit too tiny. Also, these red A's. The photography I'm using here makes these really stand out, but in natural light, in dimmer light, when you're not in a studio like I am now, these A's are really dark, a dark burgundy kind of red, so they don't stand out as much. I think they should be brighter. The diopter control is crappy. Here's a diopter control. You push it to get it out. It's this tiny little thing. So when you're trying to look through here and you're trying to touch this, unless you've got little dainty kid fingers, uh, it's very difficult to use. But the good thing is once you adjust it, you never need to adjust it again. I would prefer that when you zoom, instead of getting those crop lines, you actually get a magnified finder, but too bad. That's what you get. When you change exposure compensation, this does not highlight or stand out any. So you could be shooting all day at, say, you know, minus two-thirds of a stop, which you don't want from last night, say, and not even realize it. That's something that I think should be changed. The focus lock is kind of crappy. This is a plastic part. should be metal. The focus lock, or I should say the unlock, is this. You have to push that in, which is great if you're looking at the bottom of the camera like this. Trying to do it by feel, it's done the wrong way. When Leica made much better lenses, the key is this whole tab would push in to unlock it. Now you've got to stop and find which half has got the tab and is the front half or the back half, and it's, it's, it's a fudge. It really should be a better lock and unlock mechanism. Exposure looks great, except for the camera's propensity to blow out highlights. Exposure's right on, as it is for all the mirrorless cameras. Lens fall off in the corners. I don't see any light fall off. And again, nobody buys a Leica to shoot blank walls. That's something that the buyers of lesser-made cameras do. Leica calls their picture styles or picture adjustments as film styles. There's no film involved. It's not a film simulation. The key is if you go in here, film style, I shoot in vivid. You can set these. You've got your settings of only plus and minus two. You've got standard, plus one, plus two, and admittedly, in vivid and high saturation, color saturation isn't that great. As we'll show on the comparisons, I prefer what I get from Nikon or Canon. But too bad. Likers are never about the picture. They're all about the experience. With filters, I can put a couple of 49mm filters on here and get no vignetting, so you don't need to use thin filters. The actual frame rates. 
Well, yes, it will run at 10 frames per second, but that's with locked exposure and locked focus. Unless you're shooting something that isn't moving, the 10 frames per second mode isn't very useful for action. You can get four good frames per second with tracking focus and tracking exposure, although it will slow down a little bit if things are moving wildly or going, say, from daylight into total shadow while things adjust. But it will run it at honest four frames per second and track pretty well, which is actually among the better performances I've seen in mirrorless cameras. High ISO. I'll show you some details here. Here are the whole images. And I'm starting at ISO 50, and we'll show when we get the, the zoom-ins. ISO 50 is a pulled ISO with even more limited dynamic range on the highlights. You'll notice the only thing that's moving here is the clock hands. But I'm increasing the ISO by one stop in each of these frames. Everything looks pretty good up to about 12,500. But when we get to 25,000, the shadows become gray instead of black. And ISO 50,000 looks horrible. It changes color. The shadows become all gray, and it's just awful. The difference is in the details. If we zoom in now, this is a 600 by 450 pixel crop. This is more than a 10 times magnification of the picture. At ISO 50, you'll see the highlights are very much clipped off, so you need to be very careful about your lighting at ISO 50, but it also is the sharpest. Then as we go up to the higher ISOs, you'll see we lose detail as the ISOs increase, which is the case for every camera, because that's how noise reduction works. It reduces the noise by scrubbing away some of the grain, and it takes away a lot of the fine details with it. The problem is at the highest ISOs, Things just start to look really awful. In other words, <laughs> you wouldn't really want to use these ISOs. They're for marketing purposes. Lateral color fringes. I see none on my images, the RAW or JPEG. That's what we expect. You've got the world's best lens on here. You're not going to see color fringes. Lens corrections like distortion, there's no adjustments in the camera to turn off any of the lens corrections that the camera may or may not be doing. Whatever they're doing, they're always doing whatever they're doing. Macro performance is really good. Here's a shot. This is the full frame shot, and I'm going to zoom in with my video software on the same shot that I made. It's really sharp. This is wide open. Well, what passes for wide open? This is at f2.8, which is the maximum aperture to which you can open in the macro mode. And it is really sharp. I don't see any aberrations. And as you saw, the bokeh, the soft backgrounds, look really wonderful. Mechanically, gosh, this is a German-made Leica. Everything you see is metal. The only plastic parts on here are is this tab, this button, this button, this button, this button, some of that button, uh, the battery is plastic, but everything else, this card door, this lever, this four-way rear controller, these knobs, the, <laughs> the shutter button, these, even the thing on the top here, this is all metal. All of the lens is metal. This ring is metal. The hood, which I will show later, this hood is metal. So, yeah, you're buying quality. When you pay $5,000 for a point-and-shoot, you're getting a very, very, very well-made camera. Of course, it's sharp. I mean, here's another shot here. This is made at f5 at a 500th at auto ISO. And as we zoom in, yeah, it's a 47 megapixel camera, and it is a state-of-the-art lens. So, yeah, it's as sharp as you possibly could get. At f1.7, the lens is not as sharp in the corners of the sides, which is borne out by Leica's own MTF chart. But it's more than sharp enough. In the center, you'll see here, it is ultra sharp, even at f1.7. And that's all that really matters, because that's where your subject is. Your subject isn't going to be off on the edge or the far corner at f1.7. Spherochromatism is highlights in the foregrounds or backgrounds taking on color fringes. It's got a little bit. This is in the macro mode at f2.8. And it's got a usual amount of spherochromatism. You'll notice the highlights in the background can get a little bit green tinged, cyan tinged. And the foreground, maybe a little bit red-tinged. This is actually pretty good performance. The image stabilization works great. I get complete tripod-equivalent sharpness at about a 60th of a second all the time with this camera with vibration reduction turned off. When I turn it on, I get an honest three-stop improvement. I get about 100% of the time complete tripod-equivalent sharpness handheld at one-eighth of a second. For SunStars, it's got a rounded nine-bladed diaphragm. And there's not much going on in SunStars, as you're going to see in this series here. Really, only at the very smallest apertures will I get some weak sun stars. So, so much for that. For data, thank goodness, these cards are properly titled. 
Sony and Fuji are both do an awful job because they don't title their cards. They come up as untitled. Well, when I come back from a job and I put a bunch of cards in my reader and they pop up my Max Finder screen, I want to see the card properly titled. This card is titled Leica Q2. So when I put it into my Mac, I know exactly what camera this card came from. So thank goodness for that. A full JPEG image usually runs about 22 megabits. If it's got the usual amount of details I show you for most of my landscape shots. If it's a shot that has most everything soft in it, like that macro picture of my watch, then it's only about 10 megabytes. And if it's a blank frame, it's maybe 5 megabytes. And if I shoot something that's completely loaded with detail, like nothing but, you know, a concrete wall or a lot of contrast, then it might have as much as about 25 megabytes of file size for the JPEG image. There's no adjustment for JPEG quality. All you get is the only size you get. It's not like a Canon, a professional Canon camera that gives you 10 levels of JPEG compression to choose from. The Leica makes what's perfect. The clock accuracy is poor. This camera that I have, my sample gains one and a half seconds per day of 45 seconds per month. That is not good. I know my Mercedes have quartz chronometers in them. And even without the GPS, my 1997 Mercedes loses about 1.5 seconds literally every six months. Uh, this camera does it every day. But too bad. Your sample will be different. Let's compare it. This is shot by my Fuji X100F. This is my Leica Q2. And this is from my 11 Pro Max iPhone, which I think looks the best. Yes, I can twiddle around with a DNG file, and I can get this result from my Leica. I still don't like it, because even though I can pull in the highlights and lift up the shadows, the colors are still disgusting. At least uh, my artwork is all about color, and to me, this is just not the color I want. Yes, it's acceptable to snapshot, but as a fine work of art to go up on the wall someplace? No, not for me. My favorite is actually Canon. This is from a Canon 90D that I made. It just gives me the vividness I want. Now, all these cameras are set to their maximum saturation in this sample series here. And so the Canon has a much higher level of saturation to which I can reach when I set it that way, which I have. If I shot these all at their defaults, things would be much more planar and probably match better, but they'd all look yucky. And remember that iPhone image, which looked pretty good, iPhone doesn't have any adjustments for that in the native camera app of the iPhone. And that's it. That is a Leica Q2, probably the world's best. In fact, is the world's best point-and-shoot camera. It's made in Germany. It feels like a solid block of alloy precision, which it is. And the key is it's an immortal camera shot by immortal people. It's not a common camera. If you have to ask, is it worth it? Well, then, no, it's not worth it. The key is if your work is at the level that demands a camera like this, then, of course, it's worth it. Thanks again for watching Ken Rockwell, kenrockwell.tv, and there's a far more detailed review at kenrockwell.com.